Uh, my name's Matt Chazansky. I am the, uh, with the Office of Arts and Culture in the city of Boulder, Colorado. And um, yes, thank you. I hope you're having a good time. Colorado's a great place. Um, <clears throat> and there's an awful lot of you for a breakfast plenary on the last day of a conference, so that's great. Um, and uh, usually I like to take these times to, you know, uh, talk up the arts in Boulder and Colorado, tell you how great we're doing here, um, and uh, be a good booster. But today, um, maybe it's a little bit different. Um, I do want to tell you um, something personal um, ab about my, my, my family, um, because it really matters to what we're about to see. Uh, my, my father was born in a detention camp uh, just at the end of World War II. My, my grandparents had um, brought him there. They were refugees. They were in this group called Displaced People, DPs, the, the small countries of Eastern Europe where people had, were swept out by the war. And um, they started this, this journey of being immigrants from that point. And I grew up with these stories that they told of that experience. And um, it's been really formative for me. Um, there's, there's the story of my grandmother uh, walking to Berlin um, just in time for the, the Allied bombing campaign and the stories of her time there. It, it, it was horrific. Um, she, she ate from trash cans. She scavenged bombed out buildings. Um, they found an apartment with their last few dollars. They weren't dollars. Reich marks at that time, I guess. Um, and um, they were able to sort of survive for a little while. Uh, they decided to hide a, a Jewish person in the attic. And when they were discovered um, by the you know, few last bedraggled Nazi soldiers, they lined everyone in the building on the street and demanded to know who had, who had been protecting it. And they refused to give up that person, the, the person who had been protecting this Jewish person. And, and my, uh, my grandmother got to witness the soldiers shoot every third person in line. Uh, my family was number one and number two. Um, their hardships didn't end there. It was a, a hard story for them. That when the war ended, when my father was born in the detention camp, um, Theirs was a story of hardship, but they landed here eventually. They came to the United States, and this was a safe place for them. They were able to build a life. It was a final place where they could uh, 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 settle and be safe and not worry. And I'm, I've been thinking a lot about my grandmother and, and her story, and two things sort of popped to mind is, first of all, uh, my entire childhood was spent, every time I would go to her house, touring the different places she hid money just in case the Russians were on the way. Um, and um, actually, she's uh, now almost 100 years old. She's in a uh, nursing home, and I got the tour last weekend. Um, the, the second thing that I've been thinking about is that the story of this place, the sanctuary this place created for my family is not the same story today. There are people here now who face a similar calamity. Their lives are horrific and they have come here. Um, there are some people who have been here for generations, for millennia, whose lives are not safe here. And my childhood of understanding this place as a safe place was mistaken. And that's troubling to me. Um, there's a, a history of injustice, of racism, that is a vein through our culture that I'm only now beginning to understand, and in some ways will never fully understand. But that tragic history I have come to learn is very, very real and very obvious to many of my neighbors. And it needs correction. And the direct threat to people's lives it, it, it needs to be resolved. Um, and I struggle with the fact that there's this difference between my family's experience and my neighbors. And I, I, I guess 
my family is European and white, and that matters and to that experience. But there's more. And we know that the change that we need to bring about starts with the arts. That the change that has always happened through history has led with the artists. And you are in this field because you believe that too. You believe that there's change that is possible. And you believe the artists are ready for that and you crave that change. And that's why we do what we do and we presuppose that progress in politics, policy, society, and justice, that's what's going to make lives better and that's why change leads with artists because people need their minds to change. So now's the time for an admission. There's, there's been moments in my career where I've forgotten this um, because art has also got this power to degrade progress on important issues. Um, just like artists can grab us by the head and turn our sights towards justice, they can turn our heads away from justice. And I have been um, uh, responsible for art experiences, or I, responsible is wrong, I participated, I have supported arts experiences that are beautiful and, and intriguing and decadent and at best benign and at worst insipid because um, the art I've been congratulated for sometimes is like funded games. It's, it's serving unknowingly to reinforce systems of injustice because it ignores the real power that art has. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I am excited today, honored, to introduce you to Modus Theater because of that. Um, my community in Boulder, um, they are a group of people just like you that are demanding culture do a heavy lift, that culture works for justice. And that impact is something artists wrestle with. Uh, the artists need to understand the power that they have to change minds. And we all need to understand the power that we have through them and the responsibility that we have. So Modus Theater in Boulder, Colorado is a, a group working in profound ways on exactly that. Modus was founded in 2011 by Kirsten Wilson to create original theater in facilitation of dialogue on the critical issues of our time. They use the power of art to build alliances across diverse segments of our community and our country. Um, key to their success is authenticity, uh, using the tools of theater to elevate the first-hand accounts from the most critical and vulnerable communities in the United States. So this body of work that Modus has produced includes uh, Rock Karma Arrows, which built on the accounts of indigenous community in the wake of a series of hate crimes. Uh, then they did uh, Women in Resolution, live performances featuring stories of four Colorado women living in sanctuary. And um, I also wanna mention Undocu America, uh, courageous storytelling about the pain, struggles, and resilience of so many undocumented Americans. Um, and it's been really effective. Um, in Boulder, um, the, the movement to become a sanctuary city and to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day, those things were directly the result of city council and the community participating with Modus Theater. And <laughs> agreed, yeah. And so this is the true meaning of the term avant-garde. This is the front lines. Art actually making the change we know is possible. So here's something that's about to change you. <laughs> uh, Modus uh, produced a, the Just Us series. These are short stories, formerly, uh, stories from formerly incarcerated leaders as read by law enforcement, lawmakers, and a network from the National Association of Community and Restorative Justice. I'm gonna leave you with a highlight video of this unprecedented performance that inspired the work Modus is doing today. In April 2017, Modus Theater brought to the stage five police chiefs 
uh, the Boulder County Sheriff and DA, the Vice Chancellor of Safety at Colorado University. Uh, they went on stage with undocumented monologists and read their stories. Law enforcement leaders were not just showing solidarity with the dreamers and undocumented immigrants, they were also dispelling the false association between criminality and immigration status. The performance was attended by 250 people. Uh, there's been more than 13,000 views online, but the experience continues through those um, online, social, and traditional medias to have a rippling impact. So please watch the video and please enjoy Modus Theater. Do you know who I am? Do you? Do you know who I am? Well, think before you say anything. And having grown up watching um, newscasters and, and police officers, you know, use and utter the words illegal alien and, and um, framing me, me and my family as criminals. And then to hear some of the people on stage uh, um, utter our words and just reflect our agency as people. Um, was very powerful. Our fate was to be born fighters. Our fate was to be born poor in a country where our people have to suffer hunger, and no matter how we, much we work, we stay hungry. Your fate was to be born in the United States. And maybe to your advantage, your fate was to be born white. Do you know who I am? Turn a blind eye not to see taking the hard jobs nobody wants, and yet he's stereotyped as a criminal. I believe that we have an obligation to fight to pre protect the vulnerable people in our community. We need to learn how as a community to develop the narrative of this reality in a way that is convincing and will be convincing on a statewide basis and a national basis in a political context. I am not a criminal. I'm not here to steal money or to take anyone's life for no reason. I'm here to help. That is why I was born. Feeling and reflecting uh, has really been a luxury. When they were telling my story, I was reliving every single moment of it. The police are focusing on him, ticketing him. Driver's license. Debating whether or not to take him to jail, making him vulnerable to deportation. Driver's license. She told me I was the very first person on her side of the family to ever graduate from high school. El primero, mijo, el primero. Sometimes I just want to hand someone my social security number. Just take it, take it. Do you know what my dream is? What my nine digit American dream is? I'm going to make sure that their dreams are realized. Will you help me? Hello, everybody. First and foremost, I want to say uh, it is a privilege to be here at the Grant Makers in the Arts Conference on the ancestral grounds of the Arapaho, Ute, and Cheyenne people. I'm Joaquin Mobley, a formerly incarcerated individual, and now I am a modus autobiographical monologuist in the Just Us Project and the Vice President of Community Works, where we provide people who are formerly incarcerated with job training so that they can move from the illicit to the legal economic opportunities through our pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs. We, thank you. <clears throat> uh, just recently, we premiered the Seven Justice Monologues at the National uh, Association and Restorative Justice in June of 2019 for an audience of 1,600 people. At that performance, we both uh, presented our own autobiographical monologues as well as asked law enforcement, DAs, and legislators to stand in our shoes for a moment and read our stories on stage with us. 
The aim of the Just Us monologues is to help people understand the injustice and criminality of the criminal justice system itself so that together we can create true justice. <clears throat> we hope not only to tour this performance in front of the audience across the country and in the Modus Just Us podcast series, but in special performances at offices of district attorneys to reach prosecutors and law enforcement. Today, you will have the opportunity to hear two of the Just Us monologues, a story of Brandon Wainwright and Sierra Brock. Early this morning, Brandon and Sierra met with Roberto Bedoya and Susan Fetter, two board members of Grant Makers in the Arts who are going to stand with us on stage and read a section of Brandon and Sierra's autobiographical monologue. These two Grant Makers are listening deeply to the stories of people on the front lines of the criminal justice system so they can be better strategic allies. Through practices of courageous empathy, we can more skillfully collaborate in using the power of the human story to dismantle dehumanizing systems of punishment and the exploitation in the criminal justice system. So, so on behalf of the grant makers and the arts, we present two of Modus Theater's Just Us monologues. Thank you, please enjoy. How y'all doing? Ooh, that was a little loud. All right. <laughs> All right, so um, just to let you know, I'm gonna introduce myself first. Um, my name is Brandon Wainwright. Um, I am uh, part of the Just Us League, uh, or when uh, the Motor Theater doing uh, monologues. Um, the reason why I'm sharing my story today is because I know I'm not the only one. I cannot be the only one that has gone through this. I know everyone knows someone who has, or knows someone who is currently or has gone through this. So um, while I'm uh, doing this, uh, I have also Mr. Uh, Roberto Bedoya with me. Uh, he'll be reading my autobiographical uh, monologue with me as well. And it's entitled, uh, Trying to Live, I Lost My Life. At birth, I was named Brandon Marlow Wainwright. That is the name my mother used, as well as the teachers at school. On the street, my name is Dub. D to the UB, or you can call me Young Black King. But on a serious note, I tell you, 90% of the people from my hood are considered failures, and I'm supposed to act like I can't be part of the 10% because of the way you think of me and because my ways are often too ignorant. Tried to live, I lost my life. I have a young mother, young father, brothers and sisters at home, barely food in the fridge or water, depending on if it's on. I'm surrounded by old heads and youngins walking around with handguns, and they won't hesitate to let me know how they feel about my honor roll ass if I cannot fight. Trying to live, I lost my life. School is kind of a sanctuary, if you will, or a safe haven. It's like, look, I can be myself. I can be a nerd, I can be a thespian, I can do sports, I can do whatever I want while I'm in school because I'm living my life. This is how I wanna live. This is how I wanna live. Trying to live, I lost my life. But outside of school, I put on a whole other mask. I fight and I fight and I fight. And I am Dub, and me and my gang, we do what we do. Big time shoplifting, small time drug dealing. Like I said, in my hood, 90% of the people are considered failures, and they are the people whose approval I need in order to survive. And you might not like the guys I hang out with, but they are the only ones who have my back, and I have their back. Damn right I do. This is not the life I want to live, but this is the life I have to live. Trying to live, I lost my life. Things became harder when I turned 16. I stood up for my brother against my father, and for that, I'm out of the house. I'm no longer his, his mouth to feed. 
From 16 on, there isn't anyone to give me a roof, clothes, food. I had to go and do that with the help of my gang. And that's why, why I said I had to live, find a way. And then I was losing my life because at a young age, trying to be an adult, you know, you can't have a life. You gotta kinda give that up. Trying to live, I lost my life. But still, I'm a star student, honor roll, state champion athlete, blah, blah, blah. Against all odds, I said, kept my cards. I kept my cards. And my senior year, it is clear I'm going to be part of the 10%. That makes it. That makes it. Women, money, cars. I'm heading for the NFL. I have a full sports scholarship. I'm choosing the offers. I'm going to be pronking. Trying to live, I lost my life. So with all that heading my way, did anybody ask me why on January 12th of my senior year, I shoplifted six video stores in one night? Instead of working hard to prove what a terrible criminal I was, did anyone consider I might also be a young man having a hard time and needing help? Didn't anyone sit in circle with me and say, Brandon Rainwright, what were you thinking? Six stores in one night? You must have, got, you must have known you would get caught. I'm a few thousand, for a few thousand dollars, you threw away a hundred thousand. Full ride scholarship. You're going to be part of the 10%. Why, Brandon? Trying to live, I lost my life. No, they didn't ask. They charged me with robbery. They kicked me out of school. They made an example out of me. Nobody acknowledged that I had to be the best at being Brandon Wainwright, star athlete and star student to make the 10% and thrive. And that I had to be the best at being dub to have shelter, food, and survive. Trying to live, I lost my life. They didn't acknowledge the fact that I was locked in a terrible split that put surviving and thriving at war with each other. They acted like Brandon, the high school vice president of future business leaders of America, was a lie and that I had finally shown my true colors, black. As if I was by, some, by nature essentially a criminal. Nobody in the justice system or the school system cared enough to even ask why I did what I did. Nobody. Hey, Brandon, Marla, Wainwright, Dub, young man, young black king, why did you risk all you had work for work for it by shoplifting at a video store in one night. It's a long story, <laughs> a long story. But at the moment I made that decision, I was exhausted by the fight and I didn't even care. You wanna know why I didn't care? <laughs> because that night I was hurting and I didn't feel love. You know why I didn't feel love? Because I wasn't getting it from the parents who I thought had made me their son. They didn't come to my games. They didn't care. I was on a roll. <laughs> they didn't care that I was going to college or I had a scholarship. And why wasn't, and why wasn't I getting that love? Because I, I was living on my own at 16, away from the only home I had known. And because my parents were young, they hadn't grown up with much love. And they were busy fighting poverty as well, fighting racism, fighting their own ignorance, fighting to survive themselves, and tired, tired of fighting with me and struggling with how to raise a young black son in a place where the streets have so much power and a parent has so little. Or you can just knock it down to the fact that where I was raised, you're either born with it or you're born without it, no matter what you apply that to. And I thought I'd rather be caught with it than without it. I'd rather die on my feet than live on my knees. I needed money to live, for food, for shelter, clothes on my back, and maybe to graduate looking nice in the prom king suit I was going to use that cash for. <laughs> yeah, it's a long story that you slam into one righteous move of your gavel, and you would you would have to actually care about me to understand. 
As Cornel West said about true justice, justice is what love looks like in public. Instead of any help and support dealing with the challenges I faced, I got a lifelong label as a criminal and more obstacles to overcome. I was already tired, and the fight just got harder. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, or good morning. It's not afternoon yet. <laughs> um, my name is Sierra Brock. Um, reading with me is going to be Susan Fader. I'm actually really excited that she's going to be reading with me. I've been reading by myself for the past two times I performed. Um, um, I'm blessed to be here. I get a chance to speak problems, like you said, everybody goes through. Um, I'd say that it doesn't matter what situation you're in, small or big, it's, it's still a problem, you know? So without further ado, this one, auto, autobiographical monologue developed by Sierra Buck in collaboration with Kirsten Wilson, um, my 21st birthday. It was just us, my mom, my sisters, and me, on a trip to Cripple Creek casino for my early 21st birthday. It had been a hard spring, and we were all living out of a U-Haul truck. So my mom, with not much left to lose and wanting to do something special for my birthday, drove us all up in the U-Haul truck where we could spend one night in a real bed, take a hot shower, and I could possibly try my luck for the first time gambling with the $40 that my mom managed to scrape up for my birthday. After I had, I had never gambled before, but I needed luck and a win. I was having trouble finding a job, and I had a big ticket on me for a broken taillight and driving without insurance. I didn't have the money for the ticket or the taillight, let alone the insurance, but we needed the car. It's hard to keep a job without reliable transportation, and without a job, there was no way for my family to get back into an apartment. So I was praying for some birthday luck. First, I tried a $5 slot machine, and I lost 10. I was like, hmm, I'm gonna try the dollar machines. Like, maybe I'd have a better chance of winning something on the dollar machine. I came up with this rule to only spend $5 on each machine and then press cash and move on. I was losing so quickly, so I switched to the quarter machines and eventually to the nickels, mostly losing as I went and hoping that the next machine would be luckier. And indeed it was. I pressed cash and I was like, oh, well, damn, I just won $62. It's more than 40. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know how the whole winning thing goes. I was trying to read the instructions on the little game box, but I thought, hey, I got $62, I think that's pretty good. So I found a place where you could put a card in and cash out. As I was going to find my mom and tell her I won, these casino security offers came up to me and told me that the machine I was playing on had somebody else's money on it and asked for my ID. I told them there wasn't anyone at that machine. There was no reserved anything on it and it was just the next machine I was playing in line. I explained it was my first time being there. I didn't know how the casino rules go, but they still wrote me a ticket with an $800 fine and assigned me a court date near Cripple Creek. I later found out that there is a little known statute in Colorado called fraud, take the money, not one, that allows casinos to prosecute gamblers who are somebody else's slot credits, even small amounts like 75 cents that are abandoned on a machine. I didn't know any of that. And by the time my court case was coming up in May, I wasn't even sure the actual court date either. You see, 
My family was still homeless and living out of a storage unit. But my mom couldn't pay for the storage either, so they put a lock on our unit and I couldn't even get my ticket out. But I knew the court date was on a Monday, and I thought it was the first Monday. So I waited for the bus going up to the courthouse near the casino, the Ramblin' Express gambling bus, with $200 in my pocket, $30 for the bus, and the rest toward the $800 ticket, hoping to get some of it behind me. That's when they told me the bus that, that they don't go up to Cribble Creek on Mondays. And I'm like, damn, how am I going to get up there? My mom no longer had a car, and no one I called could drive me the hour and a half, then wait all day and take me home. I was freaking out because I already had a bench warrant because I didn't show up for the court date for the broken taillight and no insurance. So I'm calling the courthouse, trying to explain Hey, I tried to get there, but the gambling bus doesn't run. Is there a way I could reset my court date? You know what I'm saying? Ended up, my court date was the following Monday. But, like I said, there was no buses going up there on Mondays. And there actually was a way I could get a form to deal with the court if they mailed it, but I didn't have an address because I was homeless and staying with friends, and it would take two weeks in the mail. So I never made it to court. I was finally arrested in October. The timing was terrible because I had just managed to get a job after looking left and right for months. But by then it was too late. They put me in the handcuffs and put me in a police car for the first time. I was just crying. They took me to a jail far from my family up near the casino for almost two months. I didn't understand how it all worked, and I messed up the whole bond thing. I just knew that no one was getting me out. And I knew that while I was sitting in jail, I would lose my job. I knew that my eight-year-old sister was missing me bad. My mom was in jail in the springs. So my little sister had been staying with me on friends' couches, and my friends lived far from their elementary school. So I was the one who had been walking with her the hour to school every morning. And my other sister was pregnant and not eating, so it was all a mess, and I was just sitting in jail. I was ignorant about the whole situation, but I guess ignorant doesn't count at court. I didn't understand how the gambling system worked. I didn't understand the game, and I didn't understand the criminal justice system or the whole bond thing. <laughs> They said I stole $62, but I didn't know I was stealing from anybody. I didn't even know I was stealing. I thought I had won. But even if ignorance is not innocence, what about what they stole from me? All the benefits they took from my failure. I had to pay an $800 ticket, $75 donation fee, $50 jail fees, $30 court fees, all off of $62. I lost my job, and I also lost a part of my sanity sitting in that jail, worrying about my little sister, my family, and now I have a record that steals my presumption of innocence. They even put that shit about me, the Friday in the casino in the newspaper for somebody's entertainment. And when they finally let me out, almost two months later, from something smaller than a cell, maybe a trap, they said, oh, and by the way, you have a week to finish paying off any extra fees, and we hope you could steal a few hours in your day to finish your 24 hours of community service. But of course, then I have to pay for the $30 gambling bus ride back up to Tri Cripple Creek to sign up for that community service because I still don't have a car. Thank you. Another round of applause to Brandon Wainwright, Roberto Bedoya, Sierra Block, and Susan Feeder. Good morning, everyone. If you haven't met me yet, my name is Rita Valentquin, and I am producing director of Modus Theater. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again to Eddie Torres, Nadia Lokda, and the conference committee for having us at this GIA conference. It is a pleasure and an honor to share our work with you all. I would like to close our presentation with a few short notes. The two monologues that we presented here are part of a larger project that we are now starting to tour. And the monologues that you heard are also going to be featured on season two of Modus's podcast, Shoebox Stories. The first season, which will be premiering soon, is called America Series, and it features 12 prominent leaders in America, such as Jorge Ramos from Univision, Gloria Steinem, Nicholas Kristof from the New York Times, Marina Rosa from NPR, Houston Police Chief, Evangelical Leader Joan Lyon, and John Lithgow, reading the autobiographical stories of undocumented leaders from Colorado. Each reading is followed by a conversation, and each episode ends with a musical response. Yo-Yo Ma, who was just here the other day, even went to the studio just to record a song for our podcast. Thank you. Shoebox Stories and America series premieres actually next week on Thursday, October 24th. You can subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for Shoebox Stories. Also on the 24th in Los Angeles at the Museum of Tolerance, we have a launch event at 6.30. So anyone who might live in Los Angeles, please join us. And now I would like to leave you with a special preview of the America series. Thank you. If people in this country would listen to stories like this and really just take a couple of minutes to digest everything that you said, uh, it'll be a different story. Uh, this is our country too. And they get so upset when I say our, but it is our country too. And, and it's full of stories like this. If, if this were to be a, a Hollywood movie, you would be the hero. But then suddenly you're being persecuted right now, no? and, and you don't know what's going to happen to you. Well, I thought I didn't feel in English until I read what you wrote. I wouldn't be able to write that in, in English. It's not me. But then somehow, that's a beauty of uh, literature, no? that, that you can leave somebody else's experience you know and and what what surprised me is how i somehow just for a few seconds i was you for one thing it can help us understand other people who are going through this i mean you have a deep great understanding of of people who are unable to move freely so are deprived of their family and their cultures and so on and you can be such an important messenger and comfort uh, to, to people who are, are in the same situation I you know there's nothing on earth more uh, supportive than people sitting in a circle telling their stories <laughs> telling the story you think only you feel. Three other people say, oh, you feel like that? I thought only I felt like that. <laughs> then we discover that it's a, some ways about, it's about power or injustice or something. And together we can change that. So I, I read it, but it becomes um, flesh and blood when, in this context, uh, when you hear it. And I think that, indeed, you know, the problem with our immigration policy and so many policies is that we don't think of them in terms of flesh and blood. We think of them in terms of uh, policies, and it's very easy to, to create discriminatory policies uh, toward a group of people. It's, um, we, we have this natural tendency to otherize people, and I think that's um, the, the way to fight that is to um, have a real person tell their real story. And uh, that's, that's certainly what uh, emerged here.